Uh, hello. Hello, everyone. Thanks for attending my talk. Uh, I'm Wenchen Fan. And uh, today, I'm going to talk about the memory model inside Spark. And uh, Spark was come out as an com in-memory computing model uh, framework. So I hope this should be an interesting topic. Uh, a quick introduction of myself. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Databrix, and I'm an Apache Spark committer. And also, I'm one of the most active Spark contributors. And uh, uh, this is a Spark commit history, and uh, number one is Reynold, and uh, the number two is me. So see, I'm not lying. <laughs> and uh, a little more about Databricks. Uh, Databricks uh, is founded by the team who started a Spark project at UC Berkeley, and our mission is to make it better simple uh, by provide our product a unified and elastic platform. OK, let's start. Uh, so first of all, Spark is a distributed engine. And uh, so let's see the memory usage at the cluster level. So a typical cl Spark cluster will contain a master and several workers. If you use YAM or Mesos, there should be something similar, but with different names. And uh, when users submit a Spark application, so it will, we will launch a Java in some node. And then the Java will allocate a resource for the master. So the master will launch some executors for this Java. And in the meanwhile, other users can also uh, submit other applications, and uh, also there will be more Java process and the executor process. And uh, inside the executor, and the executor is a JVM process, and we will have a memory manager for this JVM, and also a thread pool, because Spark uses the thread model. So the task will be run as, as a single thread in the executor. And for today's talk, we will focus on the memory model inside one executor, not the cluster level. So here is a quick uh, overview of the memory model inside the executor. So for a, for a query, so we will first uh, read the records from a data source one by one and uh, into an internal format inside Spark, which is a binary format. And then Spark will have some operators that can operate on this internal format uh, directly. And then the operators, like sort, join, aggregate, may have some buffers, and it will allocate memory from the memory manager. And then if the, uh, the data set will be reused later, then we can catch this data set by cache manager, which also will allocate memory from the memory manager. And today, I will cover uh, this uh, picture one by one. So first, Let's see how the memory allocation works in Spark. Uh, first of all, uh, similar to other systems, Spark allocates memory in page granularity. So the consumer will allocate the memory by pages, not the bytes, which can be more performant. And uh, then we also support off heap in Spark, which means the page can either be on heap or off heap. And then comes some details. So the page in Spark is not fixed size, but has a lower bound and upper bound. And then there is no polling in, the, in Spark Memory Manager, which means the pages will be freed once there is no data on it, and we will, we will not reuse the pages. And you may ask why. Why Spark has a wide length page and no polling? OK, this is actually a trade-off. I will explain it. So the pros of this is that we can simplify the implementations, which means uh, we will, there will be no single record across the pages because uh, the page can be uh, balanced. And then uh, Spark frees the memory immediately so that the OS can use the memory like used for file buffer or other kind of stuff, so which means uh, Spark is more scalable. And also, there is a comms. So first, Spark cannot handle super big single record because, like I said before, uh, record will not cross pages. And uh, this is actually very real in reality because the upper bound of the page size is about 16 gigabytes. So actually, there will be no such a big record in, in the actual world. And some may, someone may ask about the fragmentation because there's no polling and you allocate a page and free it again and again. And uh, 
Uh, luckily, because we have a lower bound of the page size, which is also very big, it's uh, by default about several megabytes. And also, uh, in most use cases, one single record should not be such big, so which means Spark will still allocate fixed size pages. And the, la the latter is an uh, actual problem. So if there's no polling, so we will have all hit when allocate memories. And actually, because we always allocate fixed size me uh, pages, and most of the metallic algorithms should work very well. And also, like I said before, it's a trade-off because we free the memory immediately and the OS can use them for other stuff. OK, so then let's move to the internal format. As you may ask, why we choose an internal format, a binary format, instead of Java objects? And actually, yeah, we do use Java objects to represent the data in Spark. So for example, we have a law which has three columns. Uh, the first column is an int column, and the second and third is a string column. And, and for example, we have one row that the data is one, two, three, data, and bricks. So using Java objects, we may come up with something like this. So we will have a row object, which contains an array, object array. And this array has three elements. The first element is a box integer for the first column, one, two, three. And the second and third uh, element is these two strings. So what's the problem? By this approach, we will have more than five objects for this law. And also, this is have a high space overhead. So for example, an integer one, two, three should be only occupied four bytes. But actually, in this approach, the box integer will take a lot more than just four bytes. And also for the string, uh, you know, if we encode a string with UTF-8, it only takes, like for data, it only takes four bytes. But with a string object in JVM, it takes out of more. And also, uh, because of the array is the object array, so we, ha we will have the boxing problem for uh, integer columns. So we will have uh, slow value accessing. And also, to calculate the hash code of one row, which will include the recursive hash code call to all its elements, which can be very slow. And there's some more reasons about why we don't use objects to represent data in Spark. First, uh, it's hard to monitor and control the memory usage when we have a lot of objects. So for example, users want to use our object in JVM. There's nothing we can do but wait for the JVM to tell us if it's OM or it's OK. And also, it's hard to estimate the size of our JVM objects. And uh, as you know, uh, GC is always a problem for JVM. So if we have many, many objects in JVM heap, the GC will be a killer for our performance. And also, Spark is a distributed engine, so which means we have to transfer the data from one node to another. And this also includes we have to serialize our data and then send it to other nodes and deserialize. And if we use objects, this serializing cost is very high. So instead, in Spark, we introduce a very efficient binary format to keep the data in, in, the, in memory. So uh, first, this, uh, I will explain more about this format. So we will have three sections for one record, one row. So first is the non-bit, uh, non-check bit map, which can tell you if a current is non or not quickly. And the section is the offset region, and the third is the data region. I will explain it more in next slides. So let's say we have, want to put the first column in this, this binary format. So because it's an int just four bytes and it's fixed size, we just inline this value into our offset region. And uh, for the second column, it's a violence value. So we have to keep its offset and its length of its actual data in the, in the offset region. And then we put its actual data in the data extraction. And then similarly, we can also write this third column into the, our binary format. OK, so let's move to the next part. So how Spark operators can operate on this binary data directly. So here is an example. So uh, let's say users have such a query that it won't, won't read uh, JSON files, which has only two columns, i and j. The i is an int, j is a string. And then users want to do a filter. To filter, uh, the, the condition is uh, i greater than zero. And then it does a select to, uh, to get a substring of the current j. OK, let's see how the data flow is in Spark. 
first, we have JSON files. And then we will have JSON reader to read the JSON records one by one into memory with the format I explained before. And then the filter kicks in. And uh, the, filter will see, uh, uh, the filter is going to read the value of the column i. And we know that the column i is the first column and it's in fixed size. So it can just read this section directly and get the value 1, 2, 3 and do the compilation. And for this record, this example, 1, 2, 3 is greater than, than 0. So we will output this record to the next operator. The so next operator, project, it will read the, the J column, which is a string. So it will read the offset and the length to get the actual data address and the length, and then read it to substring, and then write the data to a new record, which is also a binary format. And then this is a home workflow for this simple query. Uh, the home data flow looks efficient, but in Spark, we keep, we keep asking ourselves, can it run faster? So here is the question. How can we process the binary data more efficient? Uh, to solve this problem, I have to introduce a little more about the, some background knowledge. So it's about the CPU cache. So when the computer was first came out, uh, there is no cache in CPU. And uh, the performance about, of the CPU and the memory is very close. But as the time grows, uh, CPU becomes more and more faster, and the gap between CPU and the memory becomes bigger. Which means if we run an instruction in CPU, and if the instruction wants to read data from DRAM, it can be very slow, and the CPU have to wait. Uh, to solve this problem, modern CPUs usually will have cache built inside it. With this cache, CPU will prefetch the frequently accessed the data into CPU cache to avoid accessing the DRAM too frequently. OK, uh, with this knowledge, how can we leverage this to improve Spark? So shall we just re-implement all the operators in Spark to be CPU cache friendly? Uh, well, that is out of work. So instead, we only focus on two algorithms in Spark. It's because I think the most two important algorithms in big data are just sort and hash. And uh, many fancy algorithms and systems are fundamentally just based on the sort and hash. So I think improving these two algorithms can benefit a lot of operators in Spark. Let's see a simple example. So uh, let's see, what we want to sort a bunch of records. Uh, most sort algorithms works by we just pick in two random records, compare them, and switch if it's one is greater than another. And we do this again and again to sort all the records. And for a naive sort algorithm, uh, we may do something like this. We have a memory region to keep all the pointer arrays. And also, we will have a memory region to keep all the values. And the sort works by we first pick two pointers as the two records. And then we want to compare them. We have to deliver the pointer to find the actual data and do the compilation. And in this case, uh, the AAA is smaller than BBB. So here, we switch the pointer. And Finish one, one, uh, one record sort, and then we will repeat, repeat this again and again to sort all the records. So uh, what's the problem of this naive sort? So as you can see that each compilation needs to access two different memory regions, because we first have to deliver the pointer to actual data, and the pointer and the data are in two different memory regions. And the six makes it hard for CPU cache, because it's hard for CPU to guess what's the data to read next, and which results to value poor cache locality. So uh, the way we improve this in Spark is to use a cache-aware cache sort. Uh, the idea behind this algorithm is that, so mostly when we compare two records, we can, we can get the result with, with only like the, the first eight bytes. So, uh, so here in Spark, we will Keep the key prefix, a fixed length key prefix of the actual record along with the pointer. So now, when we do the comp compilation, we read the uh, pointer, pointer array and we get two records and then we compile the key prefix. So, like, like I said before, it's mostly can be done with the key prefix. So, if, for example, if the, 
uh, the second record is smaller than the first record we do the switch. Okay, uh, by this algorithm, uh, most, of th most of the time, we just go through the key prefix in a linear fashion, and which can result to a good cache locality because CPU can easily guess what to fetch next. Next, let's talk about hash map, which is a very common uh, data structure in, uh, in data processing. So uh, for a naive hash, hash map, we will also have something like this. We have a memory region to keep all the pointers and also a memory region to keep all the key and the values. And to look up a key, what we do is we first hash this key, and then we mod it by the size of the hash table, and then get its position. And then, uh, because we have, uh, here we only uh, access to the pointer, we have to do the default reference to, to get, go to the actual data of the pointer. And then we compare these two keys. And uh, as you know, in for a hash table, the uh, collection, uh, collection is very common. So for example, here we want to look up key three, but we actually find out key two, and we do compare, and we fail. And then we will do a quadratic probing to, to go to the next entry for of this hash, hash table. And then we do this thing again. We do a deference uh, de to the actual data of this key, and we do compare. And if it matches, we return the value. So the problem is the each lookup will need to uh, need many, if the collection happens very common, so it, it will need many pointer deliverance and also key compilation. And this will, means we have two jumps between two memory regions very often, and also this will result to very bad cache locality. So the way we solve this in Spark is to introduce a cache-aware hash map. So the idea behind this is that uh, although coll coll uh, collection is very common in a hash, ha hash table, but a full hash value collection is very real. So mostly, we can identify a key with its full hash value. So here, we, uh, we get the full hash value of the key along with the pointer. So now, when we look up a key, the same thing is that we do the hash with the key, and we model the size of the hash table and get a, a hash entry. And then we can just compare the full hash value of this key and the uh, full hash value near the pointer. And if it didn't, if it didn't match, we use uh, then we use uh, the quadratic probing and uh, jump to the next entry. And uh, for next entry, uh, assume the key, the full hash value matches, and then we will do, a, to do the actual de deliverance to find the actual key and do a compilation. And if it equals, we return the value. So with this cache away hash map, each lookup will mostly only needs to, only needs one point of defer, uh, de deliverance and also only one key compilation because the full hash collection is real. And also this means we are accessing data mostly in a single memory region and which has very better, uh, which has much better cache locality. Uh, here is a quick recap of the cache-aware data structure. Um, so how, to, how can we improve the cache locality? Uh, first, for sort, we store the key prefix with the pointer. And for the hash map, we store the key for, uh, the, key, the keys for hash value with the pointer. And uh, in summary, we will store some extra information to try to keep the memory accessing in a single, single region to speed up, the, to improve the cache locality of CPU. Uh, okay, uh, mostly we have covered most of the, of the paths in this picture. And uh, uh, for cache, it's just copying the data from the binary internet format to the memory page. So it's, so it's easy, I, don't, I won't go over this. And one thing is missing here is the data, set, uh, data source part. So when your data is inside Spark, or everything is fast, we can operate on binary, on binary data and we can cache binary data. But for data source, we have to put the internal data and feed it to Spark. And this uh, will go through the data source API, which force you to construct a bunch of low objects. So which means we will, you will, we will have a lot of uh, serialization and uh, conversion cost. So how to solve this? And this, uh, 
is actually a future work of Spark. So we have several drivers to check this. So first, we will introduce a stable format for external and native code integration. So which means uh, we will have, a, for example, we will have a public uh, kernel binary format. And then uh, the external data source can just put their data into this kernel binary format and ask Spark to read it. And also, uh, we have a drill to check this to introduce a new data source API, which will include this public binary format uh, and also a current read API. Also, uh, you may mention that even the input of the Spark is a current storage, a uh, current format, but when Spark executes the, the data, it's actually in a low fashion. So we process the data low by low. And in the future, we also want to current the whole execution engine to make, uh, make Spark more efficient. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, if you are interested, uh, you, can all, you can also try these fancy things in Dataplex, uh, our uh, unified analytic platform. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Wen Chen, uh, for that insight into the developer's view of the memory model. Uh, we have two mics on either side, and we've got about eight minutes. Questions? possible to store uh, output the bitmaps which you store directly? Sorry, can you repeat? Can you, can you repeat the question? Can I store the bitmaps which you store in the Spark memory directly to an output file format or something? Is that possible? Do you mean? Uh, the bitmaps which you use to store the objects. Can you in store bitmaps? Oh. Uh, the bit. Uh, do you mean you want to store the bitmaps of your external data into Spark? Or? Uh, yeah, into external S3 directly. Yeah, we, uh, we will have the bitmap in the public binary format, and which will be released in 2.3, which is a current format, like Allo. So you can specify the bitmap in that, in that. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, give a big hand to Wen Chen. Thanks a lot for coming.